Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of The Law and Finance Show. And today we have another great guest on because one of the things that a lot of law firms and lawyers are trying to figure out is how do you really brand your identity? Like, what are you known for? What is your reputation? And one of the things that I'm excited about is today we have the patent professor on and he is just about everywhere you can think of media content. He is there speaking to his target audience. He is adding value and he is sharing some great insights. So I'm looking forward to hopping into the conversation with John Risby and you don't want to miss this episode. So stay tuned for more. So without further ado, let me bring on John. John, welcome to the show. Welcome, Terrell. Always a, a pleasure speaking to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, John, one of the things that I always like to start off with, because I know it's different, we're all over the place and around the world in the U.S. So where are you in the U.S.? So the, the physical office is in uh, Coral Springs, Florida, which is outside of Fort Lauderdale in South Florida. But uh, because I'm a, a, a patent attorney and patents are national, like I have more clients outside of Florida throughout the United States than in Florida. So patent lawyers can really practice from anywhere. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I guess, were you, um, did you grow up in Florida or what brought you to Florida? Uh, well, I did grow up in Florida. Um, after I finished law school, I went to New York uh, and, and started working at a large New York City uh, patent law firm. And I worked there for about five years before starting out my practice. And then uh, I came back to, to South Florida. That's where all my connections were. That's where I went to law school, the University of Miami. And my parents lived down here. I grew up down here. And I just the beauty of, of patent law is you can really practice it from anywhere. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So what I want to do is take a step back and just kind of talk about kind of your, you know, your, your background a little bit more. Like, you know, were you one that you always knew that you wanted to go into law or like how did that kind of unfold for you? So I, I didn't. Um, in fact, my background is probably very different than most lawyers in that uh, I started as an engineer. So, uh, uh, you know, I was the one like tinkering with with, you know, with something in the garage, taking things apart, figuring out how things worked. Uh, my father was an engineer and that's uh, a structural engineer and that's the field that I started out in. Uh, and I was kind of exposed to patent law early. We had a professor at, at uh, my undergrad who was working on a, a an invention of sorts, a way of taking crushed glass and putting it into highways so that the highways would light up from the, 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 the headlights on the car. And that just got me interested. And I started reading up more on, on, on patent law. So although I didn't always uh, want to know that I wanted to become a patent attorney, uh, I did by the time I started law school. So I specifically started law school to become a patent attorney, whereas a lot of lawyers, law students, are not sure what area they're going to focus on. But I think of you know, any patent lawyer, especially if they've got that, that engineering degree already, most of the time when they go to law school, they're not going to law school it, as an engineer to practice personal injury law or divorce <laughs> law or something else. They know they're going there to, to use the knowledge of the law to help protect ideas and inventions. And that's what I did. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I guess, you know, as you kind of went in with that, you know, that focus mentality, do you think that that like that helped? help save you time from taking electives that weren't like relevant to your goal? Uh, well, it's funny you say that because very like almost everything was irrelevant to my goal in law school <laughs> because uh, you take you take torts, you take criminal law, you take divorce law, you take contracts. Uh, and there's only there's very few courses that really focus on, you know, one course on patents. Uh, and that's true with uh, the, most law schools have very, very few uh, patent law oriented courses. Uh, 
so so in that sense yeah it didn't it didn't help me becoming an engineer in fact in a lot of ways i would say it, it severely hindered me because uh as an engineer we're used and probably you are as a cpa as well like answers are definite right you have at least as an engineer answers have decimal places in them uh they're concrete and then i finally get to an area and i start studying law and i see a decision at the trial court uh suddenly gets reversed it's like a 180 like okay <laughs> you know uh, a word goes to the plaintiff and then it gets reversed and it goes to the defendant at the appellate court and if it's appealed again uh then it could be reversed i'm like well, wait a minute this is not uh, this is i'm certainly suddenly in an area of such uncertainty uh and, you know in gray area in the law that never existed in in engineering we had we had answers for things i mean a build you build a bridge you have you, you know it's not uh set in stone so to speak but you know what the load bearing capacity is of that bridge down to at least within a range and you have a safety factor uh in there as well and you can actually show your work <laughs> to see how you came up with that a lot of times none of that's available for uh for lawyers there's a lot of gut feel that goes into it there's a lot of art um a lot of things that does don't matter in an engineering standpoint make a difference in the law like in uh, even though they're not supposed to for example you're not supposed you know justice is supposed to be blind it shouldn't really matter who you get as the judge or in my case who you have as a patent examiner uh it should not matter but the reality is it does so in addition to focusing on the technical legal aspects of an invention we often end up studying the particular person the particular patent examiner that we have and lawyers in in civil and criminal practice do the same thing they study the judge because they know that law really is not blind and certain judges have certain biases that they're that that you need to find out about if you're going to uh, practice before them and at, at least at the patent office for my practice there's certain art units that are easier to get patents from than others so when you craft the claims uh you you try to to write the claims of a patent in a way that you can get the application reviewed by the the art units that give your client the most favorable chance of success like all of this is goes completely against the grain of uh of an engineering student where we're dealing with numbers and science and science you know gravity doesn't care uh <laughs> what you are you're a rock or a feather or uh you know you know black brown yellow anything gravity is gravity laws of science are, don't have biases to them but that's not the case in law so that was a big uh a change for me uh big shock the other thing was i certainly didn't have the uh the background that a lot of law students did in terms of history and and government and you know i studied thermal thermodynamics and like theory of machines and statics uh physics like a completely different subject matter uh so that made you know the the study of law a little bit more challenging mm -hmm. gotcha. well i bet that that's probably what is what has allowed you to 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 add so much value for inventors because I, I would imagine like you said you know most inventors and anyone who's designing anything is probably not thinking about you know that human element of like who are we going to get to review this how do we word this in a way to make sure we get this across? I mean, and I guess it's, it's probably a huge advantage for you of being able to understand both sides now. It is, it is. It's uh, kind of forces you to, uh, you know, to, from an engineering standpoint, you, like you, you, the terminology is critical and you have to know what it means when you put those terms into a patent. So, you know, something, if something abuts something, it's different than if it's alongside something else so if you're defining two different gears or two different parts you really have to pay attention to that uh and 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 that's not not just something unique to patent law but for lawyers in general like words have incredible significance uh the in a contract the word that something you know may be done is completely different than saying something shall be done you know one's required uh, necessary has a completely different meaning than sufficient. So these are these are things that you know as, as any lawyer would focuses on words, but for a patent attorney, it's even more.
critical because the claims of a patent are like the bounds of, of a deed to real estate. And we have to define somebody's idea in words in a way that a competitor can't get close enough to it uh, and kind of steal the heart of the invention. Uh, and that makes that makes it a challenge that also makes that's you know, a challenge that I love. So it's it's a great kind of um, puzzle of sorts to draft claims for a patent because it tests the technical engineering side, science and math, but it also tests the, the language and writing and uh, the, the more artistic side as you're drafting claims. It's an interesting mm -hmm. combination. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, as you mentioned that, it makes me curious. I mean, like, as you're kind of working with, you know, clients that may not fully understand, like you said, that shall be done, may be done, like they don't necessarily think in terms of this makes a big difference. So like, you know, what is that usually like as you're trying to help them understand like, hey, this matters? Like, how do those discussions usually go? Yeah. So uh, sometimes uh, it's, I mean, it, you, you really have to, you know, and both in your line of work as well as a as a CPA uh, and my my line of work as, a, as an attorney, the work is the real work is never seen being done by a client. It's not like, uh, for example, my wife's a dentist. When a patient goes to her office and she struggles for an hour to take out a wisdom tooth or whatever's being done, the patient sees the work, they see the time, they see the effort. Sometimes they see the sweat and they're like, all right, this dentist is really <laughs> putting in a lot of work. Uh, when we do our uh, our patent work, it's it's hours and hours of detailed uh, work. Like we're we're struggling to find the right words, and sometimes the claims of a patent, which is what, which is where the teeth of the patent are. The patent document itself. Let's see if I have. I don't have one readily available, but it's say a half inch thick or a quarter inch thick. The claims might only be a couple pages, but they take you know sometimes you know fifteen hours to draft. And then you come back and you have these, okay, so these are the claims and it looks like a paragraph. And it's like, well, what's this take you like five minutes to do? It's like, no, it's like, it didn't take five minutes. It took <laughs> 15 hours to put this together because every word matters. And it might be similar in, in your case. I don't know enough about your field, uh, uh, but I can imagine that when you get this, the, the financial statements together for a for a client who needs them for a loan document, it just looks like two or three pages of documents that you provide. Uh, and but that does that's just the tip of the iceberg as to what you have to go through to get to those two or three pages. Like a, an income statement, for example, it's you know it's like oh this is a single page document. Yes, but uh, <laughs> it takes a while to put it together and to put it together the right way. So yeah, that part is in both of our fields is uh is, is always a challenge. And that's, that's something that, uh, and it's also a lot of it's intangible because the benefit of that claim, it's not like, you know, a swimming pool contractor builds a swimming pool. As soon as it's done, the, 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 you know, the customer's kids are jumping in it. They feel the water. They're like, wow, this is, this is great. They get to enjoy it right away. I finish a patent application and submit it. Uh, then it's just like, hurry up and wait. Now there's two, two years, two to three years before a patent examiner makes a decision on it. So they don't even get to enjoy the fruits of the work for a couple of years. It would be like a homeowner builds a house and sells it and like, oh, you know, what's right now it's 2022. It says, okay, so I'll come speak to you in 2024 to ask you, that's when you get to actually move into the house. That's how, that's how the work of not just uh, patent law, but a lot of attorneys the actual work is done now, but the benefit could be sometime in the future. Some attorneys have it worse. Like if you do, if you do a, a, like a if practice in estate planning or wills, the real benefit, the poor client's not even going to see. Like a, the wills benefit kicks in after they die. So all right, there's, I've charged you a lot of money today for a benefit that you're going to receive after you die. So at least you know. In that sense, um, we have it better. The benefits we do for our clients, at least they enjoy them during their lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that brings up a very interesting point, um, because one of the things that I, I that I enjoy doing on this show is, you know, as you talk about, like, kind of managing the business side of, of a law firm and the practice. Mm -hmm. So it's just like when you have a product where, you know, like, hey, 
I'm going to ask this person to pay me to do this work. They're probably not going to see the benefit for like two years. It's just like, how do you, for, for some clients, it's just like, do a lot of them come already knowing that? Or is that something you have to like help them understand? Like, Hey, we're going to do the work today, but you're not going to get a, it's not going to be instant gratification. Like how do you help them understand that sometimes? Yeah, so I think they're, they're very understanding when they realize that the delay is on the part of a decision maker that's completely outside of our control. So it's a, a patent examiner. Uh, you, you're in line at the patent office to have your application reviewed. Unfortunately, most of that one to two to three years is just waiting for your case to make it up uh, and, and have a decision made. So uh, I think clients are understanding of that. It still is a major uh, you know, you know, obstacle for a lot of them uh, enjoying the benefit of, of their patent. And then you, and then I have to, uh, kind of explain to them that sometimes the actual granting of the patent is not where the real value lies. Sometimes it's being patent pending so that you can start, uh, offering your, your idea to investors and to potential licensees and even starting sales. So in, in that sense, just having the application pending provides a benefit to you while you're waiting for a decision. So uh, a big misconception is that you can't start selling your product or offering it to investors until the patent is granted. And as soon as I explain that that's not the, the case, it's once it's pending, then you can do all of these things. Then that's a huge, for a lot of inventors, they, they, they breathe a huge sigh of relief at that point because it's not, oh my God, I'm just on hold for two to three years. Instead, the patent typically takes about uh, 10 to 12 weeks to draft. It's still a long time, but I would choose 10 to 12 weeks over two to three years any day. Awesome. Yeah, you know, because I was going to ask about that. I mean, with, you know, the rate of advancement and just like like technology or, or in, in inventions where things are changing so rapidly, you know, if a person, you know, has to wait that, you know, that 10 to 12 weeks, is there anything that they can do kind of before that 10 to 12 weeks? Or is it kind of best practices to, to wait until you hit that patent pending status? Yeah. So you can start, you, there's steps you can take in advance uh, as long as you're not revealing the entire invention. So to anybody. So sometimes if you want to start manufacturing and if your uh, product has multiple parts, and they're done by different uh, factories, then, and no, no one factory knows how it's put together, then certainly you can start. You can have, uh, let's say some, you know, one part of your invention utilizes an L bracket, like an L bracket by itself uh, is not gonna give away your invention. So go ahead and get that process started. And if it uses a light bulb, then a specialized light bulb that you need, go ahead and produce that, but just don't fully reveal the idea to anybody until it's patent pending. That would be the best uh, advice I would have. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, one of the things I'm very curious about, which, you know, I think you've done, I mean, amazingly well, I mean, is to what allowed you to kind of decide on, Hey, the name of our firm, the name of our website, our branding, the patent professor, like where did that, how did you come to that conclusion of branding? Yeah, so uh, you know, a lot of a lot of lawyers don't brand, and that's for a reason, and that's because the state bars did not permit branding of law firms uh, until recently has it been permitted. So what lawyers would do and law firms would do is they would use a slogan associated with the name of their firm. So that's what what I've done as well. Uh, the name, the patent professor, came from. Uh, my position as an adjunct professor at, at Nova Law School, and because there's so few of us, I just became known as the patent professor. And uh, when I started branding my firm, I, I thought that that's it's like it, it's just so natural as to what I do. And uh, but you know, natural to me, and it made sense to me. But when you're a young lawyer getting advice, uh, you know, it's not it, it sometimes. You, you have to go with your gut because the advice I got was completely contrary to what my gut was telling me. I, I was feeling, I, I felt that the patent professor really captures the essence of what I do. It's memorable. 
It's easy to, 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 to spell. It's easy to find on, on search engines. It has everything going for it in terms of a brand. Uh, but again, it also kind of pigeonholes me into one area. And that's the advice I received. They said, John, you're never going to get a simple divorce or, uh, you know, or a business contract or somebody who needs to form a corporation because nobody goes to the, the patent professor for a divorce, even, you know, or, or a, a simple tax matter or anything. And you're going to lose out on a lot of possible work for your law firm. But I, I made the decision early on that I, you know, I went to law school to become a patent attorney and that I would take that chance. And, and I really have no interest in uh, doing a divorce case, even if it is just to, you know, to keep the doors open and the, the lights on, uh, which unfortunately a lot of attorneys end up taking uh, cases in areas they're not excited about just because they need to in order to survive and keep their practice running. And I think that does that does the client a disservice because then they get a lawyer who's not really passionate about that area of law. Um, but, you know, as the, the saying goes, it pays the bills. So they do it. Uh, I don't think anybody should have their work done, especially something that's like of critical importance to them by someone that's doing it because just because it pays the bills, you really need your attorney to put in that extra, uh, uh, I guess that little bit more, than just getting it done to do that case as if it's as if it's their matter, uh, as if it's their idea, if it's their divorce, their tax case, and the only way to do that is to do something that that the attorney enjoys. So I'm I'm glad I doubled down, ignored the naysayers that thought the patent professor was too specialized, uh, and really focused on that as my brand. And it, it's it's even so narrow, it's even narrower than intellectual property because I do trademarks and I do copyrights as well. But uh, but it's not, you know, the intellectual property professor just doesn't have the same ring to it that <laughs> that the patent professor does. So I, you know, so I made a, a deliberate choice to really focus in on what brought me to law school in the first place. Awesome. I love it. I love it. It's one of those things that I, I've learned, I guess you say, uh, kind of over time with my accounting firm of where talking to so many people where they. They, they assume you're a CPA. Oh, you do taxes to where it's just like, no, we, we, we provide bookkeeping and CFO services for law firms and agencies right. like that. That's where we kind of narrow in. And, and what I will say is like it's made a world of a difference of just it's so much easier to communicate to where people understand what to expect from you when you have kind of that clear focus. So that that is awesome. <laughs> Now, one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, if people are interested in learning a little bit more about the patent professor, you know, where can they, where should they look for you to find your website online? Yeah. So the website is thepatentprofessor.com. So uh, that's probably the, the best place to find us. But anybody that's, that's looking on social media, you can just simply type in the patent professor on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, like pretty much anywhere and you'll you'll find our pages. Awesome. Now, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask about is, you know, I saw on your website, you know, the books. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the books and just kind of, you know, what can people expect when they go to buy it or go to read it? Yeah. So uh, my, my first book I wrote was Escaping the Gray. And it talks about uh, something I'm really passionate about. And, and that is, uh, you know, that for not to focus on a specific uh, like mold, like everybody thinks that there's a, you've got to, in order to achieve something, whether it's as an inventor or even in hiring that you've got to go to the right schools, have the right background, uh, social class money, whatever it is. But as a patent attorney, I see ideas just explode. And so many times they come from uh, places where it's not expected. I mean, the, the Wright brothers were, like bicycle mechanics that invented the airplane, uh, neither one of whom went to college, only one finished high school. They're from Dayton, Ohio. And that's that's time and time again, you'll find uh, that inventors surprise conventional thinking with where, you know, with, with like who comes up with a new product, like Elon Musk, for example, like the inventor of PayPal is not going to be anyone's top choice for bringing a, a viable electric car to market. Uh, you know, or 
but that's that's who did it and and uh and, and beat out you know government backed uh companies with uh with taxpayer funds like Chrysler, GM, Ford that have, you know, 100 years of history behind them but we're not able to do what Elon Musk has done with Tesla. So that's just uh the 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 beauty of of innovation is that it's 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 not predictable. And that's what escaping the gray uh, really focused on is uh, I talk about my journey in uh, leaving a large established uh, patent law firm. Uh, the firm that I was working at in New York is a law firm that represented uh, Thomas Edison for the invention of the light bulb, uh, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, and the Wright brothers, these iconic inventors. Uh, and, and, and I was kind of bored with the work that I was doing because those iconic inventors are no longer their client base. So, so these large law firms today are representing, you know, huge multinational corporations like Motorola or, uh, you know, Exxon, uh, Google. And there's, you're so far removed from the creative spark of ingenuity of the inventor that it didn't uh, really, really fascinate me. That wasn't the kind of work I, I enjoyed, uh, but that's, you know, that's that's what I talk. I talk about some of those things in escaping the gray is to escape that uh, predicted path and to really focus in and really get to know in your heart the things that that you enjoy doing and to have the courage to to follow through on that and 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 do that, even though it goes against uh, you know conventional wisdom. I know, for example, in your field, uh, it's just a lot of people have this view. You might have gotten this advice that that tax work is where the bread and butter of CPAs is like that's uh, that's the, the the easy work and the easier way to grow um, you know a, a firm of your type is to focus on that type of work and even if you're not going to do it yourself well why not have a tax department and hire young associates to do that uh, and that way you would offer that to clients it's and that's fine if somebody really enjoys it but if you don't I think uh, you're going to do your clients a disservice and uh, and you're not going to certainly do yourself a disservice because it's going to be a distraction to your main uh, passion and, and what you really like. And that's why at my firm, we've never taken on any work that wasn't directly tied to protecting either a brand or a new idea because that's the stuff I like. I only get to live once, so I want to do the stuff I like. Awesome. I love it. I love it. You know, it's amazing, like I said, when you when you think about it that way. And it's amazing, like I said, to see all the great work that you've done of building up the brand around that to where when people come to your firm, they know what to expect. They know that they're going to get, hey, this firm is probably the best at doing this. And so it probably allows you to attract the type of clients that you really want to work with. So that's awesome. Yeah. And you know what, like the, the market's changed too, to where like, uh, especially now with the great resignation and the difficulty in hiring committed, excited team members, uh, we focus a lot on, on, on clients and customers and having a brand that attracts them. But sometimes it's overlooked that your brand also attracts your team. So uh, I'm not, I'm getting the people that realize when they come to work for the patent professor, they're not going to get a divorce case. They're not going to get a tax case. Uh, so it repels the ones that are looking for more variety and it attracts the, the team members that know what they like and know the stuff that, that, that fuels their passions is new ideas and brands. So it helps in that sense as well. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, John, it has been a pleasure having you on as a guest. Before we wrap up, any final comments or any final, you know, perspective or piece of advice you want to share for those that are looking at like, hey, I'm on the fence about what, how do, what brand I want to define or whether I want to be specific or whether I want to be general. Any final comments on that topic? Yes, I think uh, my, my vote would always be with be more specific. And it's it's scary. It's always scarier to be, you know, uh, the 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 narrow niche because you wonder, are there really going to be enough people that need my specific niche? Like, say for anything, say if you're a website designer and you decide, you know what, I just want to 
I, you know, I love, I have a lot of dentists in my family. I just want to design dental office websites. And everyone you speak to is going to call you nuts because they're like, wait a minute, you know, like, what about all the other people that businesses that need websites as well? And, but if you really believe that, and that's and dental office websites is what fuels your passion, then my advice would be just dive in. Don't worry about the narrowness of the niche, especially in this day and age where you can expand geographically, uh, even if your firm is narrowly focused. So take my law firm for an example, if, if I, you know, if patent law wasn't federal and I had to only get clients in Florida, then yes, the niche might be uh, limiting, you know, my practice because maybe there aren't enough inventors just in Florida. Uh, but luckily it's, if you can expand, especially if you have a niche that can expand geographically, um, such as yours, you're not just doing work for people in any one state, like anybody that needs, uh, you know, financial guidance and help, regardless of what state they're in, like that's, that they can, you know, hire your services. The same thing with, with me for patent law and in a lot of niches, when you look at today's economy and how there aren't really state-based or geog geographical limitations, uh, then, then it's easier than ever to niche down and really do the work that, that you love and that fuels your passion and not have to worry about not having enough work. Awesome. I love it. Well, John, thank you again for being an amazing guest on the show today. Thank you. If you're looking for ideas on how to manage and grow a profitable law firm, this Facebook group is perfect for you because every week we are featuring conversations with successful lawyers and businesses related to law firms on tips, ideas, and technology that are helping many people grow and manage a profitable law firm. So if you're looking for great tips and ideas, you definitely want to click the link below so you can join the conversation and be part of the Law Firms and Finance Facebook group.